In 1961, the name Marshall McLuhan was unknown to everyone but his English students at the University of Toronto and those who followed his little-known articles in small cir circulation quarterlies. Then came two remarkable books, The Gutenberg Galaxy and Understanding Media, which catapulted the man into what the San Francisco Chronicle deemed the hottest academic property around. Playboy sits down with a man who's since won a worldwide following for his brilliant and frequently baffling theories about the impact of media on man. Marshall McLuhan, the highest priest of pop culture. Time and meaning. Mr. McLuhan, with the way your name has skyrocketed, what is it really that got you this far? What are you doing? I wonder myself sometimes. I'm making explorations and I don't know where they're going to take me. My work is designed to understand our technological and environment and its physics and social consequences. As an investigator, I have no fixed point of view. In fact, I am ready to jump out any statement if I end up deeming it unnecessary. I listen, accept, and discard. Isn't such a mythology somewhat erratic and inconsistent? The environment is in constant flux and any, any approach to problems related <laughs> to it must be sufficiently flexible. Effective studies of the media deals not only with the content but with the media themselves and the total cultural environment within the, which media function. For the past 3,500 years, the effect of the media have been overlooked. And why is that so? Because all media includes any technology or whatever that creates extensions of the human body and senses. All media are extensions of some human faculty, of some human faculty. Altering the environment evoke in us unique ratios of sense perceptions. When these ratios change, men change. History, the medium of our time, is an extension of the central nervous system. The wheel is an extension of the foot. My clothing is an extension of the skin. Extensions of one or more of the senses. That's important, so let me say it again. Use of these media rearranges the sensory balance by stressing one sense over another. The book is an extension of the eye. The book is an extension of the eye. Such an intensification and amplification numbs the central nervous system and prevents it from the conscious awareness of what's happening to it. I call this narcissist narcosis. A syndrome whereby man remains unaware of his new technology as a fish of the water it swims in. <coughs> McLuhan then goes on to explain the phrase he famously coined. The medium is the message. Or shall we say the massage? The medium is the massage, an inventory of effects. The medium is the massage. 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 The message. The message. Massage. The message. The message. <laughs> I must stress again that societies have always been shaped more by the nature of the media with which men communicate than by the content of the communication. It is the medium itself that is the message, not the content, and the medium is also the massage. It literally works over and saturates and molds and transforms every sense ratio. We see this today with the electric media, and we saw this several thousand years ago with the invention of the phonetic alphabet, which had profound consequences on man. What were these consequences? Before the phonetic alphabet, man lived in a world where all the senses were balanced and simultaneous. There was a tribal kinship and interdependence. The phonetic alphabet fell like a bombshell, installing sight at the head of the hierarchy of senses. Literacy propelled man from the tribe, diminishing the roles of the senses of hearing, touch, taste, and smell. And how about the printing revolution? Furthermore, how did television affect the world? The printing press was the ultimate extension of phonetic literacy. Books could be reproduced in infinite numbers, and this added to the impacts of individualism and detribalization. Print tore man out of his traditional cultural matrix. The electronic media at last demesmerized us. By electric media, I mean all of which have not only extended a single sense or function as the old mechanical media did. Television is the most significant because it permeates nearly every home in the country simultaneously. It offers no detailed information about specific objects, but instead involves the active participation of the viewer. In short, I would call it a cool experience, where the audience is an active constituent of the viewing or listening experience, in contrast to a hot medium that intensely provides great amounts of high-definition information. 
It's proven that a mastery of this can lead to great powers. In politics, for example, Kennedy was able to emanate interest so effortlessly and engagingly because he was the first American politician to understand the dynamics and lines of the television iconoscope. What kind of crisis do you believe this is leading into? The new integral electronic culture creates a crisis of identity, a vacuum of the self which generates tremendous violence, violence that is simply an identity quest. Youth mindlessly acts out its identity quest in the theater of the streets, searching not for goals but for roles, striving for an identity that eludes them. To be honest, I believe before we can start doing things the right way, we've got to recognize that we've been doing them the wrong way. So how do you expect we anticipate any changes? If we understand the revolutionary transformations caused by new media, we can anticipate and control them. An environment becomes visible only when a new one has superseded it, thus we are always one step behind. The present is always invisible. Education teaches us to go from the familiar to the unfamiliar, but we should reverse that and go from the unfamiliar to the familiar. Despite your dislike for the problems caused by the new electric technology, you seem to feel that if we understand its effects, a less alienated society may emerge from it. Are you then optimistic about the future? If we refuse to see them at all, we will become their servants. Personally, I have great faith in the resiliency and adaptability of man and our potential to grow and learn. We live in a transitional era of profound pain and tragic identity quest, but the agony of our age is the labor pain of rebirth. There is a long road ahead and the stars are only way stations. But we have begun the journey.